I'd like to welcome everyone to, uh, my name is Karen Clifton. I'm with the Catholic Prison Ministries Coalition. And I wanna, I am so grateful for the gift of your presence and a webinar that we have really been looking forward to. Uh, but before we begin, I'm gonna ask everyone if they can just as they're transitioning from work or uh, dashing and this is their opportunity for lunch, to just take a second. We're gonna pause and for you to breathe a couple of times and to listen to uh, the words to, to kind of set the tone for, our, for the meeting today from a person in our century that has been very holistic and reconciling. And that's uh, Bishop Des Desmond Tutu. We need other human beings to help us to be human. The, solidarity iso the solitary isolated human being really is a contradiction in terms. We are made for interdependence, for complementarity. I have gifts which you do not have, and you have gifts that I do not have. We have our own gifts, and that makes us unique. But the first law of our being is that we are made for interdependence. We are made to exist in a delicate network of interdependence with our fellow human beings and with the rest of God's creation. So in gratitude, we take this opportunity to join together. And we're also grateful very much for our two presenters today. We are gifted today. We have the opportunity to hear from Mike McGillicuddy from Colby House. He's a licensed clinical social worker and a member of the Ignatian Volunteer Corps. He served at Colby House Jail Ministry as well as Chicago's Cook County Jail for the last four years. Mike completed his undergraduate degree in theology at Christian Brothers University in Memphis while tutoring men confined to Memphis's Shelby County Prison Farm. And he subsequently completed master's degrees in sociology, social work, and industrial relations. Early in his career, he was the founding personnel director for Chicago's Metropolitan Correctional Center. His later career was a dual one, serving as a registered principal of investment advisory firm and a psychiatric social worker. I know there's some connection there. Uh, his passions include jail and prison education, cultural and religious depolarization, mastering Spanish, and the blessing of growing old with his wife of 48 years, Mary. So thank you very much, Mike, for being here. And his co-presenter is going to be Travis Bowen Bond. Travis is a Shining Lights program developer. His experience has been in the creation and management and coordination of innovative solutions that work to address pressing social justice issues, specifically in the area of international development, homelessness, quality food access, and reentry. Through these experiences, he has witnessed the amazing capability of people and communities to drive positive change, while simultaneously learning the art of applying evidence-based solution. I'm grateful for all of that. His educational background includes completing his undergraduate degree in business administration at Colorado State University, the global campus, and the master's, having and acquiring a master's in applied positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania which we're grateful to uh, reap the benefits from that. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Mike to begin um, this webinar on the accompaniment of the whole person, a psychosocial and educational approach. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Karen. Greetings to all who share a passion for serving our incarcerated sisters and brothers. And thank you to the Catholic Prison Ministry Coalition team for hosting this webinar. As you may suspect, I'm a firm believer in psychosocial and educational approaches to jail and prison accompaniment. Just as Catholic educational and medical institutions engage with the whole person, I believe Catholic jail and prison ministry is called to the same mission. There's a unique backstory for Kobe House's involvement in what we call personal development ministry. In 2018, there were approximately 6,100 individuals detained within the walls of Cook County Jail. Colby House served these women and men in three ways, through the remarkable chaplaincy of Associate Director Deacon Pablo Perez, 
through the sacramental visits made by a cadre of priests, and through a network of religious volunteers permitted to enter the jail once a week. Because this cadre of volunteers was capped by Cook County at 30, access was clearly inadequate to the number of detainees. During the summer of 2018, I approached Kobe House, says, Kobe House's then executive director, now auxiliary bishop, Mark Bartosik, with several out of the box ideas designed to accompany the whole person without violating religious volunteer limitations. I joined Colby House as an Ignatian volunteer that summer. I've been assigned some case management responsibilities, but the majority of my service involves educational and psychological group work within the jail. This programming functions as a magnet, excuse me, functioned as a magnet for talented and enthusiastic volunteer instructors. As they came on board and jail administrators warmed to our work, the number and variety of groups expanded. We peaked in March of 2020. Cook County Jail was an early epicenter for COVID. In that context, personal development ministry options were stark. We could fold, we could hibernate for the length of COVID, or we could pivot. We chose to pivot by creating DVD content as well as correspondence versions of several of our courses. Many of us have been back inside the jail for one year now. Here are examples of courses we've delivered over the last four years. These will not be all of them. Well, the first and the most prominent, some of you are already familiar with. It's called Painting by the Heart, and it's an amazing one-on-one -on -one art ministry offered by Daughter of Charity Angel Henke to detained women and described in a May 5th CPMC webinar. Sister Angel is a treasurer, our model personal development minister. She's been doing this for 15 years. There may be artists like her in your ambit. Stay on the lookout for them. Houses of Healing is an emotional awareness, emotional healing program widely used in correctional institutions. It describes a path to behavioral change, dignity, and respect for oneself and for others. This program was well received by participants. I urge you to check out the, web, the website of the Lionheart Foundation, the sponsor of Houses of Healing, for more information. Financial Health is a very popular course created and offered by volunteers who are themselves financial professionals. It's a prime example of a course offering which detainees actively seek. We've offered it in person, via Zoom, and via correspondence format. Book clubs are also popular and address the incredible tedium which often accompanies incarceration. Our selections have been as varied as Unbroken, a World War II story of survival, resilience, and redemption. Dale Carnegie's famous How to Win Friends and Influence People. Shaka Senghor's Writing My Wrongs, Be Free Where You Are, the presentation Fitch Not Han, delivered at a correctional institution, and Jay Shetty's Think Like a Monk. I particularly commend to you both for ministry self-development and as a book club offering Chris Wilson's Master Plan. Other classes that we've done include Men and Masculinity, a very creative course, uh, Addiction and Recovery, presented by a PsyD, a doctor in psychology, Poetry Workshop, correspondence course, Life After Loss, directed to people that have sustained a loss of a family member uh, while incarcerated, Career Development, and two distinct anger management offerings, one directed to men and another to women. My favorite class is Overcoming Obstacles with Strengths. Perhaps it can serve as an example of a personal development class. Each is different, each is designed by a different instructor, but this is much of what I do. This is one of the, of the three classes that I do inside the jail. Here's the premise of this course. What's wrong with the question, what's wrong with you? So it's a bit of a, of a brain teaser, isn't it? What's wrong with the question, what's wrong with you? I usually get 
furrowed uh, brows when I asked the question, and I keep asking it over and over. Um, correcting problematic behavior is important, of course, but this particular framing, what's wrong with you, shines, shines all the light on negative behaviors and neglects positive character traits. A more powerful, if initially confounding, question is, what's right with you? Because it elicits more positive answers. It prepares the way for a more hopeful answer to our ex existential question, who am I anyway? It takes courage to discover the deepest truth of who you are. It also takes time. And time is available in abundance at Cook County Jail. Prolonged, unstructured paper, uh, periods of time are hallmarks of incarceration. If they are not filled with teaching moments, the abundance of time can trigger, trigger profound boredom and even clinical depression. Incarcerated women and men may never have more time to do the work of reflecting on their lives than they have during confinement. Doing the work also benefits from accompaniment, having someone to do it with. The sharing of fresh input from a variety of vantage points, overcoming obstacles and strengths, the course that I'm most associated with, endeavors to accompany program participants as they discover who they are through a strengths lens. This discovery is helpful in the quest to overcome obstacles to sobriety and to full flourishing. My practice personally is to introduce a series of ritual, rituals into classroom practices. Nobody has to remind us to brush our teeth, right? It's inculcated, it becomes automatic. We all know that change is hard. Research suggests that learning new tricks, adopting new behaviors, breaking old habits may be harder even than we realize and that sadly, many attempts at change fail. Instead of depending entirely on self-discipline, we need to introduce rituals. Remember Aristotle's words, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is, an act, is not an act, but a habit. So in, in the groups that I do, there are a series of rituals uh, book ending the, the specific content for the day. So we begin by arranging chairs in a circle to facilitate conversation and uh, uh, line of sight. We introduce uh, and welcome new participants, uh, telling of them what, who we are and what we do, and introducing St. Max, Maximilian Colby. We chant the Colby rules. Rule number one, never ever give up. Rule number two, always remember rule number one. And rule number three, don't let the good times be forgotten. Then we lead a mindfulness meditation exercise to a piece of instrumental music and facilitate a check-in exercise for, to go around the room for everyone to check in. Many ways to do this. One I, I particularly like and happen to have done yesterday is called a rose, a thorn, and a bud. A rose being something going well in your life, a thorn, something painful that you're going through, and a bud being a, a, a the, the first indications of a change within you that while fragile and small, if nourished and protected, can grow into a rose, right? So that's how we check in. Then we talk about the topic for the day. And I, I can describe for you what a typical day would be like. The, the top of the content will be, and I'll do that in a moment, but I want to bookend with the three rituals that end the session. Introducing a story, proverb, or quote, with a relevant message, followed by a discussion of its meaning. Participating in a gratitude exercise, it's always powerful, always powerful. And then listening to a piece of contemporary music with lyrics consistent with group themes. Group participation is strongly encouraged, but never compelled. In fact, participants rarely pass and they're customarily uh, gracious in listening to one another. I resonate with Monica Guzman's observation in her book, I Never Thought of It That Way, that, well, if I'm being honest, it's still a huge mystery to me how powerful it is when people come together just to talk. 
what begins as a passing meeting of minds can grow into something transformative and unstoppable, something that even quietly and subtly can build, maintain, or cross bridges that span the gulf between all of us. Crossing bridges is exactly the point. Group work creates bridging social capital, not only among the people that are inside the walls, but among those of us who serve them. That's social capital also. It also bolsters self-confidence when it's at a low ebb. It offers motivation during a period of searching. It challenges rumination on distressing thoughts and it reduces problematic behavior among participants. I don't have the stats to bracket it up, but my strong hunch is that active participation in programming is associated with substantially lower recidivism. So I've got here, we don't have time to go over it, but I have, I have a 90 day curriculum, the beginning with strengths. Early in the curriculum, we introduce the values and action signature strengths inventory. Each person takes it. We've done about 450 of these. This has become a, another ritual asking people, tell me what's right with you. And they are expected to recite their strengths. Um, each, each class has something to do with strengths and then some associated topic. An associated topic might be something like, how can we keep getting up whenever we fall down? Or how can growing in wisdom help in the battle against addiction? And so on and so on and so on. Colby's personal development ministry began in part as a response to limitations placed on religious ministry. The good news is that religious ministry opportunities are now somewhat less restricted than previously, which begs the question, apart from serving as a workaround, is there a role for non-religious volunteer service in Catholic ministry settings? I say yes. The biblical injunction to visit the prisoner doesn't specify the topic of conversation. We do well to begin conversations where the person is rather than where we think that person ought to be. I regard religious and non-religious service inside the jail as complementary, just like the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. Some lay Catholics are drawn to religious accompaniment, and I celebrate that. It is wonderful work that those are probably who are listening to this program do. It's exceptional work should never be diminished. But many of us develop valuable skill sets in secular settings. We too are called to visit the prisoners. And finally, these groups are impactful. They work. Detainees consistently tell us so. Catholic Prison Ministry Coalition is so valuable because it facilitates extensive networking among all of us, right? In the same fashion, I've been privileged to network extensively with Shining Light and introduce them to my Cook County co programming colleagues. I'm certain that you'll be as impressed as I am with their creative ministry. Take it away, Travis. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Um, I am going to share my screen actually with a little bit of a. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks, Mike, for, for that. And um, appreciate the, just grateful to be here today. And thank you, Karen, for the introduction and, and inviting me. I think Mike initially invited me and then, then got connected with Karen and um, feel very privileged and honored to get to, to share some, our approach, a little bit about um, the Shining Light approach to doing our, our programming inside prisons. And um, I love this title. I think it kind of sets us up well and sets me up well for kind of to share our history and everything like that. I think we've taken a fairly unique approach and a very windy path to get to where we are. So I'm gonna start with sharing a little bit about our history because um, I think that helps sets, thing, sets things up. And then a few of the key concepts we've really kept in mind as we've begun to develop additional programs, especially in the midst of COVID um, and needed to rethink a lot of um, ways about doing things. And um, I really hope that my dog does it <laughs> right, right before I was starting and right before you uh, passed it over, Mike, my dog was howling. 
Um, so hopefully he does not continue to howl. Um, whenever he hears a fire truck, it's the funniest thing. He just does a little howl, but um, I digress. So if, if you hear that in the background, everything's okay. But so just a little bit of a timeline of the history of Shining Light. So the organization was actually founded in 1996. It was founded by my dad, Jeff Boone. Um, and his intent was how do we expand the perspectives of students from a small town in central Pennsylvania? So I was doing a church choir, going to different cities, doing going to different churches and very much um, how to like have those experiences that really teach the students more about themselves, others and God and creating experiences and moments for that. And did that for a few years. Then in 1999, actually doing a tour in Chicago of all places, um, they couldn't find a church that would take them in on a Thursday night. They couldn't get anyone in the pews. Um, to come and watch their performance. So the pastor, they, one of the pastors they were communicating with suggested, well, we have connections with the youth detention center. Why don't you go there? And so in the, this uh, idea of expanding perspective, my dad said, yes. And um, then immediately got completely terrified because he had never been in a prison or uh, facility before. And so about 20, 30, or 20 to 30 um, students from central Pennsylvania going into a youth detention center in Chicago and they were pretty nervous and had no idea what to expect and it's kind of their expectation is like we've been going into churches and it's like one of the most supportive environments you can think of um, to take a choir and then thinking oh this is going to be the opposite and um, but as I'm sure many of you know it was that was far from the truth it was an extremely um, eye-opening eye and just a, a great experience for everyone in the room. Um, the most impactful time was after the performance was over, there was a talk back to hear from the audience of what did, what did you think? Um, just as a way to build some connection. And everyone just expressed so much gratitude for showing up and for doing something so nice and intentional and meaningful for, for them. And so then that kind of spurred the organization to focus on doing that work for the next 16 years. Um, and so taking students high school, college age into facilities throughout the country from Rikers Island to San Quentin, uh, putting on performances as a way to kind of to encourage those inside. Um, very much focused on hope and trying to, um, at the end, just asking folks to like, what, what is your next step? How do you, how do you want to use your time while you're in your situation. We're all figuring that out on the outside. What does that look like for you on the inside? And so, um, and one of the crazy things with all of this is there was about $200,000 worth of equipment for the stage, lighting, truss system, sound equipment that would be taken into each of the facilities as well, Rikers and San Quentin included. And that was one of the things that my dad, like, I don't know how he fully pulled that off, it was a little bit of, he would always say like, no one told me I couldn't. And he just figured out how to avoid the no and would get these full productions inside. And then in 2015, um, the idea of how, what's the next step for the organization? Um, how, how could we do this even better and focus more specifically on the incarcerated community? And that's when the impact workshop start, started. And it was the same idea, how do we, do a performance that focuses on expanding perspective and in developing an individual's understanding of themselves, others, and God. So instead of it having being students coming from the outside in, how do we do this peer to peer? So working with about 30 to 40 individuals within an institution for two weeks, bringing in trained professionals to teach them and give them the skills necessary to put on a performance, um, song, dance, spoken word, and dramas. And then there would be a presentation at the end of the two weeks. It would be for 200 up to 300 audience members from the facility. And again, um, really trying to kind of jumpstart the facility and trying to be more active, do, doing, getting more involved in programming just as a way of encouragement. And um, so profoundly impactful for, especially for the 30 to 40 that did the two weeks and team building and um, putting together the performance and a lot of those individuals weren't artistically inclined and a lot of the audience was showing up to make fun of everyone on stage but 
the two weeks was all about how do you find the purpose and how do you find meaning in what you're trying to communicate? And that always came through and no one ever laughed. And that was, so it didn't matter how good you were, it was what you were trying to say. And so, um, and that was profoundly impactful for especially the 30 to 40 on stage. And the, we would go back a year later to kind of check in on the, those groups and the trajectory and what individuals were getting involved with had completely changed for a lot of folks and kind of that idea of jump starting um, positive change really um, could start through those two weeks. So quickly in 2017 ish, um, the organization really started to ask like, why is this working so well? And so what are we doing? <laughs> because we're not doing like it, art therapy. We aren't doing like, it's not, it wasn't fully focused on spiritual development in a specific way. It was very much about how do we come together as a group to go about this performance and to, to make it impactful for serving your peers. And so that started this conversation and trying to figure that out and navigate that as an organization. And then in around 2019, got connected with the University of Pennsylvania and the Applied Positive Psychology Program and really found a lot of things that aligned with what the organization was doing in practice and what the research was showing through, um, through, that, through that field. Um, and so in 2019, there was, the organization started to really try what are some other ways we can go about um, this, this process? How do we have the same impact, but through a different method? The, the impact workshops were ex extremely intensive um, on res resources as well, just financially, it was about 80,000 to do each of them. Um, you could, and then it, just the human capital, it was exhausting for everyone involved. So how, again, how can we go about this in a different way? And then COVID happened and forced that transition to have much faster um, and really taking, okay, how, how do we leverage the 20 years of experience from a lot of the staff going, who've been going inside for this amount of time, as well as some leading research and how do we make that into some programs that are as effective as possible and still have that transformative impact and work toward um, really changing the culture of the facilities that, that, that are touched. So I wanna share like four of the kind of key concepts that we've kept in mind in that program development um, as a way to just to explain our approach a little bit more and then I'll share the programs we're currently offering as well. So I wanna start with negativity bias. Um, and so I, luckily I think most of my, or almost half of my uh, presentation is comics. So hopefully you enjoy them. Um, but it, I think this com, com, comic represents it well, but it's just, just this idea that it's a general principle recognized in psychology that our attention as humans is if there's one bad thing as compared to good things, if there was, so say you have two equal things, a, a smiling face and a frowning face, as humans, we're more likely to notice the, the frowning face. Um, and so we have this greater, we have this bias towards noticing the things that are wrong. And this happens with our emotions. It's easier to get angry or sad more so than it is to get happy um, or to, to feel joy. We also notice negative events more in the news. You hear a good story and a bad story at the same time, you're probably gonna notice, remember the bad stories and bad story and like process that a little bit more after the fact. And then also we, we do that with people. Um, we notice negative traits a little bit easier than positive traits. And so we'll notice the things like jealousy or um, just cynicism more so than we would notice kindness or honesty in others. So, and this kind of comes from um, over time, just our survival before a modern age, survival kind of relied on this and the, the humans that survived were the ones who were noticed were a little bit more on edge, were more skeptical of the, the experiences they were having in the wild. Um, and I think this comic kind of speaks to it in a fun way in, in the sense that the, the, one, the cave, one cave person that was cool as a cucumber ends up getting attacked by the saber-toothed tiger instead of, um, instead of fleeing and surviving. And so, and this is also for our visual systems there was an interesting study that, um, so it compared an angry face versus a 
happy face and in a split second, people's attention, they would notice the angry face first, but then it compared an angry face versus a snake and people would notice the snake before the angry face. And just so like kind of the intensity of survival impacts where our attention goes. Um, and so this can trick our brains in our modern age at times and can be, um, can be extremely helpful still in no knowing moments when we need to survive and um, noticing things that are going wrong. It can still be a survival tactic and it can be something that distracts us from being honest with our experience at times as well. And I think, again, this comic shows we can hear all these great compliments all day, but oftentimes we'll go to bed thinking about the one bad thing that um, was thought about or said to us. And so I think negativity bias in general has huge implications um, for the criminal justice system in general um, and everyone involved. So whether politicians, taxpayers, the incarcerated, prison staff, volunteers, um, it just has huge implications. And I think it can be helpful in understanding how our system got to where it is as well. Um, and which leads me to via character strengths, which I know Mike mentioned. And so within the field of psychology, it was also, it can also, you can apply negativity bias to that as well, in the sense that the, the field really focused it on the, the worst traits in people and focused the research and treatment and practice of that. Um, what went wrong or what's wrong with the question, what wrong, what went, what's wrong with you? Focusing in on that question first and, until 1999. And that's when the field of positive psychology was initially identified. And you can think of it um, on human experience between negative 10 and 10. In the past, psychology focused on how do we, what's negative 10 to zero? What does that look like? What are the mental illnesses that are out there and how do we treat those? And then the, uh, the founder of positive psychology recognized that, okay, if you just treat mental illness, that doesn't get you to 10, that gets you to zero and gets you to neutral. So how do we get, what does it look like for someone to go to zero to 10? How do we tap into different, the different traits, experiences and positive institutions that draw out the best in people? And via character strengths is a key component of that. So you might know of the DSM, which really identifies the mental illnesses that folks have or might have, or what, what do those look like? How do you treat them? Character strengths looks to complement that in expanding our, the repertoire of, of access and information in regard to, okay, beyond mental illness, it kind of completes mental health in the sense of what are the best traits that people have? What are the things that you're expressing um, that are um, also just as true as what that mental illness might be, but what are the, but your strength and how do you, how do you, what does that look like for you in expressing that? So some examples of the 24, creativity, bravery, love, teamwork, forgiveness, gratitude, spirituality. And I think, and I started with negativity bias because I think this, the reason character strengths become so important is because in a, I think a prison context, I've been sentenced. I, when I think of, if I were someone who's incarcerated, I've been sentenced, I've been told the bad things about me. I'm working on my bad things all the time. And there's a miss there in being honest of, well, what about the strengths that I also have? And reminding folks of the importance of that because we can dwell on that negative more naturally than intentionally prompting to build up the positive, build up the strengths that you have. And how can you leverage those in different capacities and, and in different environments? So, so those are via, via character strengths. So a lot of our, our work is oriented around that. And I think it um, really prompts um, great conversation, great reflection and great um, opportunities for creating environments that are supportive and help people move in a positive direction. Um, then I wanted to touch on the forgetting curve. Another key concept as we've kind of transitioned some of our programs is this forgetting curve. Um, and it pretty much, it was at first identified in the 1880s and it's been replicated a few multiple times since in research, but um, the likelihood of you, everyone watching this, remembering what we say in a week is pretty low and within a month, it's even lower. <laughs> so it really supports the need for that repetition. I think Mike, you were talking about that in regard to how do we build these habits? 
How do we build these? Um, how do we come back to some of these key things that can help move folks and move individuals and, and develop in their development in the same direction? So that's also something we really try to um, focus in on. And so we, our programs, they all are associated around um, creating different touch points in regard to a lot of the similar topics. So, um, so if I hear about character strengths one day, I don't just wanna leave it there. I wanna keep touching, keep coming back to it, keep, keep reflecting on that so it's not forgotten over time. Same thing with negativity bias. One of the main exercises we do in some of our programs is the what went right exercise as a way to kind of counter that negativity bias. How do we dwell on the things that went right? Which is a profound question inside a prison as I'm sure um, many of you can relate with. It's like in the midst of what can feel like chaos, what went right? And trying to really identify those moments, dwell on and savor those times where things went good or could have gone worse. And coming back to that, how do we not forget that over time? And I think one thing as an organization, we've always considered, our, we've never considered ourselves a reentry program. Um, until recently, and I think historically we've always been like we're doing we're doing programming in prisons, reentries for individuals when they get out. So after someone gets out, then you start reentry, or in six months, a year leading up to it. And I think we've really um, started to frame ourselves. No, we we think of reentry as like day one of being in prison. I think it's called the Department of Corrections for a reason, um, rehabilitation and corrections for a reason is from day one, how are we moving in a direction that's going forward and keeping the forgetting curve in mind that if I, if I only learn about one thing six months before my release, the chances of me remembering that unless it's touched on and practiced over time is pretty limited. And so then that brings me to the fourth and final topic I wanted to touch on, which is the arts. So you can kind of see our stage set up from, and these were the peer-to-peer -peer, um, impact workshop per performances. Um, but we've, we've always used the arts. There are kind of two reasons. One is it's always been a bridge. So being small town um, students from the outside going in, the arts was a natural way for everyone to connect on something that everyone gets. Everyone understands music, dance, can, can find some common ground on that as well as self-expression. A lot of the pieces during the impact workshop that were created were actually written by the, the, the team inside. So really allowing that space for self-expression. And we've continued that. And this is part of our way to um, combat the forgetting curve is to use the arts as a practice ground for how do you apply character strengths? Well, we can talk about that all day and we can talk about scenarios and reflect on that all day. And we spend a lot of time doing that. And how can we do another activity to apply these strengths in an intentional way um, in a, that's more engaging, can be more fun, um, and allows for intentional challenges as well, intentional challenges to really like go beyond something that might be comfortable. We just had some guys um, do a spoken word presentation um, last week, and we had um, other residents or incarcerated folks there, as well as some staff. And to have that moment for those, the five guys who were in that course to present their pieces that they've been working on for the past two and a half months, just created a really cool moment. It wasn't on a stage. It wasn't as big of a deal as, la as what it historically has been for Shining Light, but it still allowed for that moment to practice bravery, to practice um, creativity, to practice um, social intelligence at the end of the day too. So it was a really cool moment. And it shifted the perspective. I think one of the coolest things was one of the prison staff, she shared with one of the guys afterwards that um, a really interesting thing in regard to, she's like, I'm not going around asking what did this guy do anymore? I'm going around asking what can this guy do? And I thought that, mm, that was really cool to hear of like, yes, like, let's think about the potential of the individuals we're working with. How do we unlock that in a meaningful way? So there's four concepts, negativity bias via character strengths, 
the forgetting curve and the arts. Um, we we kind of keep those things in mind all the time in, in our programs. And kind of our golden package program right now is called the Shining Light Academy. And it's 26 sessions, includes five different components. The first component is learning your strengths, focusing on character strengths, and it, a creative writing, then a character development, and then a playwriting, and then what's called the wellness recovery action plan. And again, in all five of those components, the first thing we do is practice what went right, trying to combat that negativity bias and diving into how do we can we use our character strengths to do creative writing where individuals write their own pieces, own poems, own short stories. And then also how do we practice the character strength of teamwork in writing a collective play together that we then present to Shining Light staff as an audience. So um, through those 26 sessions, the goal is that folks just have more confidence, are able to identify their strengths and have more hope in their ability to accomplish the goals that they're set out to do. And so it, that meets twice a week. So it takes about three months to complete. And so after that point, and it ends with what's called the Wellness Recovery Action Plan, which is very much um, a self-management tool that kind of takes everything that you've learned from the Shining Light Academy, as well as any other programs, and puts it into an actual step-by-step, -step, what's my daily process and daily plan for staying on track and what's going to get me off track. So kind of leaving, leaving them with a very helpful tool um, that can be impactful. And then we also reinforce that through the loop. And the loop, it's a magazine, we put it out every other month and it really looks at uh, each issue is oriented around a specific character strength. So we're currently working on one for um, curiosity and love of learning. We just did one on spirituality um, and the, all kinds of different activities and opportunities there. I know that's, Mike's used that in a few different formats as well um, as just a resource, but anyone can subscribe to it. And then um, finally, we have video series that we do um, that are available on tablets. So playwriting, um, we're, we have a spoken word lab as well. And um, the, we, we're finishing up a, a character strength uh, video lab as well. So the idea is that if I'm an academy participant, I'm also getting issues of the loop that reinforces the content that I'm seeing. And if I have a tablet, I am also have access to videos that are kind of commenting on these same things, going through the same idea of how do we use the arts to practice um, these other psychosocial, so psychosocial skills in, in a group context. So I'll stop there. I think I was a little over 20 minutes, but hope. <laughs> Excellent. This, this is so exciting. Um, and, you know, thank you. Thank you. And I think you're getting uh, accolades from the group as far as thank you for this presentation. But, um, any had the same question I had right on the top of my head was, um, you know, how is this with both of the facilities and especially uh, Mike with you having Sister Angel, who we were able to hear at our past town hall uh, and yourself going in and doing this positive work and then all of the good work that you're doing is how does this impact with the way the correctional staff view the people that are incarcerated and um, have you done any of these programs with the staff? Uh, you know, so that they can, you know, it's, it's a negative, the carceral system is very much, we need it as in the world to be focusing on the positive, not the negative, as you, you know, with research proved. So how are you addressing that, both of you? How is it affecting? How is it flowing over? Well, it's a great question. Um, I would say that, first of all, a Colby House is bought in itself. We had a workshop, uh, a one-day workshop in which all of the volunteers and staff members came together and uh, after having taken the VIA signature strengths inventory and shared their signature strengths with each other. And in fact, in our dining room at Kobe House, we have a board in which it, there is a, a listing of the top seven strengths for each of the staff and volunteers, which is really cool. So it's very prominent there. Inside the jail, uh, Travis and I presented a, a workshop to the top uh, four people in division three happens to be the women's division. And um, then after that, they, ex they decided that to take it to the next level. And so we did the entire programming staff. I actually did that one. I, we did the entire programming staff. And we had a, 
uh, a readout on each of the 24 strengths, a one page explanation about how, it, how it's acquired, how it develops, what's, what are relevant questions for each of the participants. Um, we've asked the, uh, for a while, Travis and I were doing regular meetings with the staff to see how they were doing. Uh, like anything else, it, it's sort of hard to keep the momentum going. The, the executive at the jail who was most involved and most affirming of this retired. Uh, her successor is also very involved, but you know, getting her feet wet and all of that. Um, we have at, at, at Cook County Jail, there's always an officer in the room for every group. And in that, in that setting, I sort of make a decision about whether this particular officer would be up for participating in the group. And often they are, often they are. And so they, you know, they talk about strengths and gratitude and all the things that the group is, is on. It is very difficult to get correctional staff schedules to permit anything like this. It's a very difficult thing. So uh, we haven't been successful with that yet, but we definitely have some interest in a number of our programs in staff participation. Yeah, and I, I would say there's a huge opportunity there too. And just in regard to, um, I think a big for character strength specifically, a key tool, a key way to use the tool is creating a common language around strengths. I think a lot of research and a lot of um, frameworks that are used for prison programming, whether the risk need responsivity model or good lives model, they're oriented around step one is to take a like strength assessment or strength based approach to things. But what I've noticed is it's never clearly articulated what is that strength based approach. Um, and so I think that's where character strengths can be a really important tool and a, kind of a main criteria for character strengths in their optimal use is that it's good for both an individual and someone else. Um, it has a positive impact for both the person expressing the strength and those around them. So I think it kind of naturally fits in, in regard to um, this setting, as well as beyond that setting. It's, I mean, character strengths and character strength training is being done in Fortune 500 companies and all over the place. So. Um, yeah, so I think there's a huge opportunity there as a, a just a how to how to make it easy to make meaningful points of connection that are positive and better. So, so I, I think yeah, there, there's more more hopefully more to come with that. Very much so. We're um, we're also getting comments about you know thank you for this progressive work and there there's many opportunities like this. Um, the, does the state prison need to pay in order to put on any of the uh, put any of your programs on their tablets? That's you know that's an area that we need more information about. So uh, to make it available to the inmates, do you have to? How does it get on the tablets? Yeah, so we've um, partnered with a couple of tablet um, companies. All of our content is free um, for the incarcerated. We we have been um, cautious or on who all we're partnering with in that regard because of the prison industrial complex. Um, and so we we work with APDS currently, American Prison Data System, um, and Adobo. And Adobo is e, like an educational app. So um, that can be found on most of the tablet companies. And APDS, they are, um, they're like full service. They provide the tablet and everything else. And that is a charge solely to the prisons um, and the state and not to any, of, there's no fee for the incarcerated. A lot of Adobo is an app on a tablet that sometimes is purchased um, by the incarcerated, but in the midst of COVID, the majority of those have, have um, they've gotten, a lot of people have gotten them for, for free as well as, but then it's like on that tablet, there's things that you can pay for if it's more entertainment based, but Adobo is, is specifically solely free for the, the, or at least our content. I think there might be some content you pay for, but yeah. We, the prisons have to pay for it, for Adobo to go on to the tablets and they're willing to pay for your, have your program added? Yes, I think ours is just like the standard or it's like kind of with like their standard package or like the default package that you get with a tablet. Okay. Or with Are the you, Adobo app, yeah. 
And uh, could you give us an idea on the scope of this kind of nationally? Are you, both of you, aware of other parts of the country that it's in or other ways it's been used? Yeah, tablets specifically, I know. Um, I, your program. What? That your program, the strength oh. program. Oh, yeah. Um, so my understanding is like Colby House and us are the only ones currently doing it. We're currently offering programs in North Dakota, Ohio, and Pennsylvania through video conference. Uh, but then our, um, our tablet reach is currently to 22 different states. And then our, uh, the loop is going to, I think, I think it's like at least a little over 100 facilities at this point um, with different subscribers. And that's, I'm not sure how many states that includes at this point, but. That's great. We will make sure that we have um, that your material is on our, our CPMC's website. So if anybody that is listening wants to uh, access how to get in touch or to uh, pass this information on to the facility that they're working on in currently, that would, we, you know, we want to facilitate that because this is a, a positive program and we're so grateful for your, your ministry. Karen, may I, may I respond directly to uh, Cheryl Sobolewski's uh, question on the that's posted? Mm -hmm. um, she said, I find uh, that there is not the interest in the prison system to make a more positive forward thinking approach to helping the incarcerated use their time productively. And I couldn't agree more. There are a lot of constraints on that. But I, I want to I just want to share with share with Cheryl my first day in Division 10, which is a maximum security men's division at Cook at Cook County Jail, the program manager told me, this is four years ago now, the program manager told me that he's absolutely certain that there's an association between programming and lower incidents, fewer incidents. And if I don't know if the research is out there, maybe someone would know, but if that is the case, and I, I believe it to be the case, right, then that would be a selling point to, to, be, to bring these programs in. Yeah, agree, agree. Thank you for picking that up, Mike, on the and, and comment on that. Any other last last thoughts? This is just um, it's kind of one of those things that just it's common sense. Um, we've seen it a lot in the in the European correctional systems as far as creating positive environments, welcoming people, and doing uh, to work for transformation day one. So thank you and applaud to for picking this up and making it go forward here. One, one more thing I'd like to say, the, the uh, Harvard Club of Chicago is tutoring a one-on-one -on -one inside Cook County Jail. How cool is that? Wouldn't it be great if the Notre Dame Club of Chicago or the Georgetown Club of New York City or you know the fill in the blank club of wherever Catholic prison ministries are located took the same initiative? I think that would be wonderful and would build social capital bridges. Thank you. Thank you for making this swing back to the positive as programs were. Yeah. Uh, and Derek is saying, I believe P P Research Institute uh, may have data on the cor correlation between programming and lower rates of recidiv recidivism or violent infractions, for sure. Uh, and we met a really inter interesting institution in South Carolina, actually. Um, called Allendale Correctional Institution, and there's a great documentary on the transition of that pro of that facility from being known as one of the worst in South Carolina. And South Carolina has a super low budget for for their prison system in general, um, but that facility has done a complete 180, and so much of that is because of the programming, and so much of the programming is led by the its peer to peer um, programming as well very much around character development. Um, you're required to be in so many programs per, per week to even be at the facility. And so super, it's a, it's, it replicates a lot of the European models, I think in a little bit of a different way, um, but at the, there's a documentary I can look up and try to put in the chat right now um, in regard to that. And definitely supports that idea that programming and incidents, whether on the inside and as well as recidivism, there's definitely a correlation there. Thank you, thank you. And also uh, prison fellowship, I had the opportunity to visit a dorm in North Carolina that they're doing values-based 
and just having the men and they take the worst units supposedly and they introduce values and starting having people live in you know in a constant environment of a positive environment value and structure and uh it's it's transformed prisons so it's you know it makes total sense and we're you know i appreciate all everyone that's on this call that's moving this needle towards uh restorative approach the truly re rehabilitation with these systems so thank you guys both of you for your presentation and for your willingness to to share your ministry with us we are uh also grateful and so many will benefit from this uh webinar so thank you thank you um, on our just our couple of minutes left, I'm going to give a couple of, of uh, real quick commercials. Um, we have our next uh, upcoming uh, town hall is going to be on nonviolent communication. So it's a perfect follow up for uh, this this webinar. It's from heart to heart, which empowers men and women to live increasingly free and fruitful lives through mindfulness practicing and teaching nonviolent communication and yoga, meditation, and healing of trauma and decision-making, conflict resolution. And then um, we have our next um, webinar is, is going to be uh, our, no, our next, then our following town hall, our general one, is Introducing Families of, of Incarceration, our next webinar. And, uh, and this is going to be uh, Joyce Dixon Haskett. Uh, we'll discuss her book, Level of Response to Traumatic Events. Um, Joyce is a impassioned, wonderful speaker, and this is an area that we have um, not paid enough, CPMC has not paid enough attention to, is the fallout and the wide rippling effect of incarceration and how it affects families. And um, she, this is her ministry and her focus, and uh, she has done a beautiful job with it. So it will be a, a wonderful webinar to attend. And then um, on June 16th, we will have uh, another Colby House presentation, which we're glad to, as is, is, uh, Mike made reference to, with Deacon um, Perez, Pablo Perez. And, um, you know, Colby House is, is located three blocks from the nation's third largest jail system, as Mike has discussed. And over the past three years, uh, has been have, Colby House has substantially grown their program to addressing our reentry clients. So this is our reentry webinar uh, town hall. And um, more importantly, they're, they're addressing their needs for spiritual and emotional accompaniment during the early stages of reentry. So this will be presented by Deacon Pablo Perez, and he'll talk about the evolution of the Colby House reentry program. And then uh, last but not least, we are definitely interested in getting our uh, synodial feedback from you, if it's at all possible. We appreciate those that have forwarded their uh, surveys and information because we do want this population to be represented and we want your voice to be represented as representatives of the church going in and uh, to make sure that the universal church addresses our needs to be a welcoming and, um, and all of the needs that are for this ministry. So we appreciate it if you, the QR code there is on the screen and um, we, you, we invite you to share your reflections on a survey if you have not done so already. So uh, Travis and Michael, thank you. Um, Y'all did a fantastic job and we were so grateful for your ministries and may they continue to grow and spread. And, uh, and, and you have accomplished that by sharing it with us. So we will be messengers of the word and carrying this out for you. So thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. God bless. Thank you all. Thank you all.